Fred Edmund Jr., Senior VP, Executive Editor, Larger Black Enterprise. Welcome to another edition of Beyond the Hype. Um, and we really are here for a very powerful discussion with the President and CEO of the Eagle Academy Foundation, um, one of the nation's just leading um, innovators in terms of uh, education, particularly for um, young Black boys and men. Um, but today's Beyond the Hype discussion is almost kind of a rock and a hard place discussion. Um, because we're in the middle of this pandemic, and obviously we have the um, civil unrest, the protests, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the pressure is on to get our kids back in school. So I want to, David, as we call, kick off this conversation, say there's really two hype stories. Usually there's only one. One is the hype that says, oh, for the safety of our kids, we have to keep them home. We can't put them back in school. Safety of our teachers, safety of our administrators. Uh, this is not a good time with the pandemic clearly not under control to put our kids back in school. And of course, it varies from state to state, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, the other hype says you have to put the kids back in school for, for two reasons. One, parents who are trying to go back to work need to have to know their kids in a safe place, but also particularly for disadvantaged um, communities, these kids get their you know lunches, they get food, they get um, you know, wellness um, and, and mental health support and, and, and just being isolated um, for long periods of time is just not good for their educational development. So as, as an education leader, you guys are literally stuck between a rock and a hard place. So before we jump into that conversation about whether we send our kids back to school or not, and what do we have to think about? Tell me what's happening for the Eagle Academy, for, for your young boys and men, for the families that you serve, and for you as an educator dealing in this environment. You know, it's interesting, Alfred, right? The, the Eagle Academies, are, we sit in a place uh, where everyone else sits. We, we are not a network of charter schools. Uh, we are a network of traditional public schools. So for anybody who doesn't know, um, Eagle Academy is a grade six through grade 12 school model uh, for young men of color. And we've got, as we sit here today, 3,000 young men across our six schools. Uh, and we've got one in every borough, uh, in, in, in each borough of the city, and we have one in Newark, New Jersey as well. So six, six schools that are serving all these, these young men. We are guided by the direction of the Chancellor's Office in New York and the Newark Public School System in Newark. So it's, it's an interesting mix in that we're often seen as kind of an autonomous organization, but we work in close proximity with the district offices in these cities that we serve, right? So that, that being said, um, the, the, we have spent a lot of time with our Eagle principals, our parents. We've done a number of what we refer to as our virtual village, where we've been in conversation and communication throughout this entire pandemic with our students on a weekly basis, uh, with our parents on a weekly basis, as well as on a more regular basis with our school leaders, uh, working together to ensure that we'll have a successful transition and making sure that everybody that's part of the Eagle family is, is as all right as they can possibly be, right? A lot of our families have lost their jobs. There's been a lot of loss of life uh, within the Eagle community. Not fortunately, none of our young people um, and none of our teachers, uh, thank God, not going to work. Um, but just extended family and of our, of our young people, um, there's a level of trauma that has been happening there. I, I would say to you that it's really the larger issue of, of what the return to schools looks like uh, much more broadly because Eagle fits within that space. Um, I was asked by Mayor de Blasio to serve on the return to school uh, co commission that he put together of uh, 40 leaders uh, from around the city, corporate leaders, not-for-profit leaders, the president of Columbia University, the president of NYU, and so many others um, when we were brought together to kind of lend our own level of expertise through our own particular lens around what will it take to return to school. It was a very difficult process to be engaged in. Um, to be honest with you, I don't think they were asking the right questions of our committee, if you will. Um, but it is the classic example of being stuck between a rock and a hard place. There is no easy answer to this situation. Um, you, you've got the notion of Again, the economy needs everybody to return, uh, to students to return to school. Otherwise, parents can't go to work. And, and that will continue to slow down 
uh, economic growth and, and, and opportunities for people to be at work. The other side of it is, if this is a sure enough crisis and, it, and is a sure enough health issue, um, then how do we take chances with the lives of our young people? And not only our young people, but the adults. See, here's the part that's not really talked about that often. The, the, the pandemic represents a greater threat to the teachers in the school than it does even to the students in the school. Mm. There's not been a lot of issues with sixth graders, you know, who are dying from COVID. But your, your 52-year-old social studies teacher who may have some uh, preconditions is a lot more at risk. And across the Eagle Network, we've got 250 teachers across our schools. Right, and if you start thinking about the numbers across New York City and across the country, see that's where a huge part of this problem is. So as we start to lean in even more, here's what you started to find out. There are at least 15 to 20% of the teaching force across New York City, which has already indicated that they're not returning to school. Mm. They don't wanna give up their jobs, but they'd rather lock in on the virtual learning because they don't want to take a chance. Either they have pre-existing conditions that will prevent them from returning, or they also are at home with mom or dad or grandma, who they also take care of and don't want to take any chances on bringing anything back into the house. Um, up until now, we really haven't had a handle on what those numbers look like. It's starting to take shape now, and it's a significant number of our teaching force. That's number, that's number one as part of the issue. Then you've got parents who have said, I don't care if you're talking about a blended learning model where my child comes to school one or two days a week and the rest of the time, you know, it's gonna be learning from home. I'm telling you right now, my child is not returning to school until we have a vaccine, period. Wow. What that percentage is, they're still determining, right? Did the city put out all of these surveys to try to get a deeper sense of these numbers? And that data is still being compiled as we speak. So the whole notion of how do we bring everybody back to school? You cannot bring everybody back at the same time. School, so social distancing in schools <laughs> is an oxymoron, right? And so you've, you've got to say there's only a certain percentage that we can bring and have in a class at any one time. Um, and, and think about the challenge of having even 12 second graders in the same classroom. I mean, just by definition, Alfred, they play, they hug, they jump on each other. I mean, that's, that's what it means to be eight years old, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so trying to figure out how you manage all of that is not going to be easy. There is no easy answer to this. I have said to the chancellor's office, there should not be a one size fits all top down answer. Right? A lot of this should be kind of from the bottom up um, and letting schools and the individual communities kind of create some of their own solutions and, and best responses to this. And it's tough to do that when you're working in a bureaucracy that is used to having a top down, one size fits all kind of uh, approach. That's the culture of the larger system that we exist in. And it's now running head to head with a reality that says top down, one size fits all is not the best way for us to be doing this. We've got to figure out how you do it um, where the community really gets to lean in and talk about what's the best solution for that particular school. You know, you, you talk about the, the risks to teachers and administrators and, and obviously every life is important and that we're past 150,000 Americans who have succumbed to the virus. But the ones that have been most memorable to me in the New York area have been, I just remember it, it sticks in my mind. I believe the young woman was only in her 30s. She may have been only a 30 year old. I think she was a teacher or a principal in the New York school system. Um, so so you, like you said, the, the, the underlying health conditions, and you don't have to be in your 50s. You can be in your 30s, sure. we're starting to see. And a lot of our younger teachers who are, are in that risk, at risk group, especially uh, those from black and brown communities. Absolutely. You're also in an environment where um, and not just the parents and the teachers and, and administrators and leaders like you, but everybody thinks they're an expert on education. Uh, you know, I mean, everybody is weighing in on this school thing like, I know what's best and we need to go <laughs> back in school. Right. I graduated from high school. How hard, how hard can it be? Sure, exactly. I can weigh in on this. 
<laughs> exactly. So, I mean, you talk about being willing to allow the community to weigh in. Um, how does that translate into policy when so many people think they know? Um, that they know what, what, like you said, I went to school, I know what it's like. Why can't, sure. we, why can't we do that? Sure, sure. So in my mind, see, what I'm talking about is, is a way in which you actually reimagine what the system itself actually looks like, mm. right? So, so that's not the system that we have right now. So I, I, I'm, I'm talking about the way in which I think the system actually ought to operate, right? The way it operates now is um, people are upset. They're knocking on the door. They're saying, let us in. Uh, we want to have a voice. And the voices of parents and community particularly in the New York City school system, but really all around the country, is generally um, dealt with on the margins. Mm. We, say, we say that we want parents to be involved, we want the community to be involved, but at the end of the day, they want you to be involved on their terms. Um, school people believe absolutely that they know best, and uh, you know they don't mind if parents get together to, to bake cookies and raise a few dollars, but, uh, but really leaning in and weighing in on policy that, that's always been resisted, right? Um, I, I, just am, I just operate from a different framework where I have a much greater level of respect for the community um, and, and believing that um, I don't see the community through a deficit model. I, I believe that our, our community, th these are their children mm -hmm. and that they ought to have a much greater say in overarching policy as it impacts their children. Um, but that's been a long-term fight uh, within the system. Um, school unions want to be able to have, in many ways, final say over what happens. School administration and the, and the powers that be downtown. Um, and so how we engage community has always been an issue. And in fact, it's, it's what you're seeing playing out right now, Alfred, in this Black Lives Matter movement. The community folks, these young people have hit the streets talking about criminal justice reform that they were tired of standing down and waiting uh, for those in power to, to, to make the adjustments, mm -hmm. right? Like Frederick Douglass always said, power concedes nothing without demand. And so demand is playing out right now. And you're seeing policies changing all across the country uh, as a result of these young people who have gotten out there and who have put it on the line and have said, we're not going to wait. We wanna see changes that are, we wanna make changes happen. Uh, we wanna see change happening. And I, I think that you're just now starting to see some of that shift into the space of the education sector. I'll give you an, I'll give you an, uh, uh, one example. Um, there is movement happening right now before the state legislature that are com coming from educators and, and young members of the Black Lives Matter movement to say, we wanna see mandatory teaching of black history in the K-12 space all across New York City. Now, right now, there are individual schools who get to make those decisions and say, do they want to teach Black history? So, so a school that's in the heart of Bed-Stuy that has been committed to the community for a long time, they, they have long been doing that. The question is, how do you get the little white kids in Bayside, Queens to also be exposed to Black history where they otherwise might not opt to do that? How do you put policies in place to ensure that that happens, right? Though that's a movement that is afoot right now. Why is that important? That's important because if you look at the example of somebody like Drew Brees, quarterback from the New Orleans Saints, who got in some trouble for making the comment that he wouldn't take a knee when the fo when football returns, and he really couldn't understand why people would do that because you know his his father and his grandfather fought for this country, and so in honor to them, you know he would never take a knee. But, but, but what he was, was assuming in that, in taking his position was that my fathers and my grandfathers did not fight. Exactly. You exactly. see, and, 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 and so when, 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 those, when that information was brought to his attention, it really was enlightening for him because he did not know that we have fought in every war that this country has ever had. The, the, in fact, that the Re American Revolutionary War, the very first person to die was a black man, Christmas Addicts. Yes. Right, and so, but it really, in so many ways, wasn't even his fault. He's representative of lots of folks, white and black, 
who don't even know the contributions that our people have made to this nation. They don't know anything about a Paul Robeson. They don't know anything about a Lorraine Hansberry. They don't know it. They, be, why? Because they have never been exposed to it in a K-12 educational space. So how do we close that gap? People don't close it oftentimes voluntarily. You've got a mandate that folks are gonna get this exposure to not black history, but true American history. Tell the whole story. Yeah. Because otherwise, <laughs> right? People are being fed a lie when they believe that their folks are the only ones that made a contribution. And so when they don't hear the whole story, subconsciously, they come to the realization, well, what did black folks do? I never heard that you all did anything. And so therefore, you must be less than. And when you are less than, that is what allows for somebody to say, I can put my knee on your neck for eight minutes and suck the life out of your body because at the end of the day, you're less than me anyway. Because that's what my K-12 education taught me. I yes. never learned anything about that you guys contributed anything other than being slaves in this nation. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So that's sort of psychological impact. You're taken away. You're, 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 a deter you're, you're a detriment, so. That's right. So absolutely. Listen, yep. you, you said earlier in terms of, of the conversations that you've been asked to have as an expert, um, you know, with the, at the request of Mayor de Blasio and, and uh, you and other education leaders being pulled together. And you said that, that, that in many ways they were not asking the right questions. Right. For, for this audience, but beyond the hype, sure. what are the right questions that, that we, parents, teachers, the community at large, should be asking as we wrestle between the rock and the hard place of uh, educating our kids in this environment? You know, it's interesting, right? Because we, so just so you clear about when I, when I say they weren't asking the right questions, mm -hmm. here are the kinds of things that they were asking. They were asking questions like, how, how many times, how many times a day should the young people be allowed to go and wash their hands? Should they eat lunch in the lunchroom or should they eat lunch in their classrooms? How do you provide a level of social distancing as they come into the building and as they leave the building and as they're walking through the hallways? Should, if you're in high school, go from your English class to your math class or should we keep everybody in one room and let the English teacher come to you and the math teacher come to you so you reduce the amount of movement in the buildings? All good questions. But those are questions really for the educators in the school system who they were not talking to. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to the leaders of my schools, the Eagle Academies, and I started talking to school leaders all around New York City in every borough. And I found out that for weeks and weeks, they were not even at the table. These conversations were not even being had with the people who run the schools. I, I, I found that completely unacceptable. And so when you bring people together, like the head of the Children's Aid Society or the head of Columbia University, you don't want to be asking them about how many times a day the kids should be washing their hands. You, you, want, to ask, you want to say to them, so if social distancing means we can't bring everybody back into that building, how do we expand the footprint of schools so that we can in fact get more children in at one time? How do we then say partnerships with the local universities? How do we use NYU space? Mm. Since NYU is not gonna open up, look at all the space that they have. Look at all the space that Columbia University has. What about the local YMCA? What about all of our public libraries? What about all these not-for-profit organizations that run after-school programs, buildings, spaces that are not used during the day and are not being used after school during this pandemic? So you've got Eastside Settlement House, you've got Brotherhood Sister Soul, you've got all these great places with great facilities that are being completely unused right now. Houses of worship that have community centers, that they, they're basically saying, we've got plenty of space that you could bring, and now you can actually have more students back in quote unquote school. Being back in school doesn't mean having to be in PS 167's building. You could be using the public library right across the street with the teachers from our school. Those are the kinds of questions I was talking about that never came up. I, I raised it, but there was no follow-up to those conversations that should have real impact to, 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 to help ensure that 
more of our kids can in fact get back into a school facility somewhere, allowing more of our parents to be able to be freed up to go back to work. Um, looking at the community mapping that lots of organizations have already done. This information and data is already there. Mm. We should have been able to execute on this two months ago. They're just now getting around to this. The questions around how to ensure that there's broadband access for all students. You've got a percentage of our kids who the, the Department of Education gave everybody a laptop, but couldn't ensure that everybody had access to the internet. Wow. wow. We've got a, a significant population of our kids who are living in homeless shelters, yes. who don't have access to the net. Young people who, who want to be educated, I've got a laptop and I can't access the world. So I'm, I'm just out and have been out for four months. How do we ensure that come September, when we are saying we're back to school, that everybody is back in place and everybody at the very least has access? What if they told us nobody was returning to school and all of school is gonna be handled virtually? Well, what does that mean for the young man and the young lady who four months ago, when this thing kicked off, did not have access to the internet. And now, after two more months you add in for the summer, five, six months later, still don't have the access. That, that, that is a complete shame. That is on the leadership of the city um, to ensure. And I will tell you right now, having talked to leaders at Spectrum and Verizon and others, they still have not been brought to the table to ensure that all of our children in New York City will have access to, to broadband, uh, uh, broadband access before we come back. That is the kind of thing that you're supposed to hold the mayor and the powers that be to account for that. Well, this, this is such a big beast of a logistical challenge. I mean, you, you put, uh, man, that's just a, whew, it's a yeah. lot. It's a I'm, lot. A, I'm on a meeting when I get off with you, Alfred, with, with folks from the City Hall, as well as uh, folks from uh, Spectrum, to talk about they stand ready to fix this. They're just waiting for the mayor to do the deal to make sure that it happens. It's just, it's incredible to me when I start talking about leadership, what leadership is supposed to look like in times of crisis. You roll up your sleeves, you lean in and you get it done um, on behalf of our children. Because otherwise, when you say, well, our children are the most important thing, that, that's, that's rhetoric. Yes. Right. Everybody can say that. Every school across America says that. But how you behave in the middle of a crisis tells me everything about what you really believe and how you really are working to ensure that all of our children are getting what they need. We know it's a tough time. The, the, the best thing that we can do is for all of our children to be able to be back in school, not just because it allows their parents to go to, to work, but because school is meaningful to be around with your peers, the interaction with your teachers and the other adults, right? I mean, you know, school is hard, but, but school is important. That's what, to be able to, to, be able to give that, that, that young person a hug, to give them that pat on the back, to continue to encourage them educationally, socially, emotionally, all of that is part of the youth development process. School is important. And our parents have come to have a greater uh, appreciation, right? <laughs> Having had their kids home all this time. They said, oh, no, I don't know how these teachers do it. But you can't do that in, in total right now because we don't have a vaccine. And if folks start getting sick, it will it'll create an even greater panic, right? But, but we have to do the best that we can and not leave any of the cards on the table and make sure that we are, we're just trying to cover all the bases. And I think that, that that's what it's incumbent upon us to do. You know, so much, and this has been a recurring theme um, over the last several months, um, both in real life and in, 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 in my interviews and discussions with people from all walks of life during this, during this series. Um, one of the recurring themes is that the current circumstances is forcing us to do many things that we could have been doing and should have been doing all along. That the transformation that this, this is forcing um, is, is, is pushing us to do things that we could have been and should have been doing all along. Uh, with, right. with that idea in mind, what will education look like um, when this is over? And when I say this, um, could a vaccine come out? It's possible, but it's quite possible 
that coronavirus could be one of the many types of viruses that we learn to live with um, and have, treat without having a vaccine. Um, not like HIV AIDS, which we do not have a vaccine for, but we figured out a way to, to, to progress as a society with that reality as part of, part of our, 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 our condition. What does school or should school or will school look like um, in, the, in the foreseeable future once the crisis is passed, but we are still living in a post-coronavirus environment? There are a couple of things I would tell you that I think um, will happen and some things that ought to happen in education. So here's, here's one of the things that I think will happen a little bit in the short, short term, but certainly over the course of the long term. Educators have been thrust into this virtual world. Our, our, our kids have been ready for it for a long time. They're, they're, they're a lot more comfortable navigating these spaces. Our teachers and adults have gotten a lot more comfortable in the space. That's a game changer, right? Because the opportunities now uh, have, what, it, what, what this experience has taught us is that education does not have to exist simply within the four walls of the school. Mm -hmm. This virtual learning space is here to stay, vaccine or no vaccine. Um, here's an example of something that in time, I think you will see. You are going to see the, the class, the, the elementary school, the middle school in Brooklyn that did not get good math results because they've always struggled to get a really good math teacher. That school now is going to have the opportunity to have their kids learn math from a phenomenal math teacher who's teaching in Michigan. Mm. Doesn't have to be the teacher that's right in front of the room in your class in Brooklyn. This, this, the, 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 the access to the technology is now going to say, we, you might have a phenomenal teacher that we now have a relationship with their school and they're in India. And they're going to teach the math class. Why do you have to be limited to Mr. Moore as your teacher in your classroom? Mr. Moore may now adjust to being an assistant and supporting what you are now going to get some direct teacher teaching from one of the best math teachers in the world who can now teach from his living room in, in, in another city, another state, another country. Like the possibilities of how that can open up opportunities so you're no longer just limited to that one teacher that you've been used to and, uh, and, and been limited by, right? So again, opening up the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, long term, what when you reimagine and an opportunity to recreate what schools should look like in the first place. Alfred, I will tell you, here's where, we're, here's where we should really be going. Why do we do school in the first place, right? For, for far too long, we have been schooling, but not educating, mm. right? So, 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 so this exposure to high stakes testing, I think has been something that has worked to the detriment of our children and our communities, and particularly uh, our communities of color. So many people who go to school every single day, you think about this, in New York, we, we invest between the time you're in kindergarten to 12th grade. That means we've had you for 13 years in our public school system. And sometimes we have pre-K, we've had you for 14 years. We've invested over $300,000 of taxpayer money into that one student. And that student comes out at the end of the 12th grade and can't tell you what a congressperson does they can't tell you the difference between what a state assembly person does and what a city councilman does. They don't know how money is made in this country. B basic kinds of things that they can't even tell you because they don't know how to actually go and solve problems in their community and make stuff happen, right? Because they've not been educated. They, they've just been schooled. Mm -hmm. It's a difference. Mm. Going to school every day and just doing the routine of school 
reading the books that you read, studying the things that you do, simply for the purpose of taking the test next week. And then ask those same kids uh, two weeks later what you, what you learned. They don't even remember. It had no meaning for them. It had no impact. It was not relevant. It was not authentic stuff. It was, it was just studying for the purpose of taking a test. And then at the end of the year, we take these state exams that we spent all this time just boning up for and studying and taking it. And it actually doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Most people can't remember anything about that. You know the kinds of things that they remember? They remember things like when I was a principal in my first year in the Bronx and all my kids were in the lunchroom. And one little girl, Dolores Sayers, was sitting in the classroom. And I said, Dolores, you're supposed to be in the lunchroom. Why are you here? She said, I'm getting ready to go there now, Mr. Banks, but I'm just so upset because I'm looking out the window of the classroom and our school was right on the uh, service road of the Major Deegan Highway. And she looked out right across the highway. There's a huge cigarette advertisement overlooking our school. And she said, something about that just doesn't seem right. It's almost like it's, it's encouraging all of us to smoke. And I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. You know what happened? We stopped everything we were doing in that school for two weeks, Alfred. And we had everybody in the school engaging in how we get rid of that cigarette advertisement. Mm. First of all, why should we get rid of it? So in our science classes, we were studying the harmful effects of nicotine on the body, right? In our law classes, they found out that there was proposed legislation banning the use of cigarette advertisements within 5,000 feet of schools. So the math classes were outside uh, measuring uh, the length of cars to determine the average length of a car. And then what the estimated a number of cars between the front of our building and the front of that building that had that cigarette advertisement to see did it fall within the legislation, right? And in the English classes, they were writing letters to the city council and, and to the mayor, actually in, encouraging the mayor who was Giuliani at the time to sign the legislation banning that. Didn't have any disciplinary issues. We didn't have to encourage kids to come to school. Everybody was in, everybody was focused, everybody was excited. They weren't just locked down in the class, they're going outside and they were about, how do we solve a, a community problem? And we put all of that together, sent it to the mayor. Don't you know within a week, Giuliani's office contacted us and said, they were so impressed that an entire school sent them letters and they wanted us to know the mayor's gonna sign this into law next week and we want you to bring 35 of your young people down here to the blue room for the bill signing, which we did. And within 30 days after that day, to see the city workers come and remove that cigarette advertisement. You know how empowered those kids felt? Yeah. There were a bunch of kids in the ninth grade who said, we did that. That's what education should be, Alfred, right? But meanwhile, the kids down the street were just going to school every day and taking a test, no impact. And, you know, but they go to school. We ought to figure out how do we make a difference so that young people come out paying attention, woke, understanding how power is, 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 is leveraged in their communities and in this country. That's why so many people don't show up to vote in presidential elections and state government and city because we don't practice that in the K-12 experience, and then we put them out to the world, and then we turn around and say, I wonder why people are so apathetic, and why people are not tuned in, and why so many folks, it's not that people don't care, we've not developed them in that process. That's what the school system ought to do, and we've not been doing that. Wow, so, and that's why you're you. <laughs> that's why we need more people like you solving these problems. It, it, just it, it, before I let you go, um, What's the number one thing I think people need to, to be thinking about in their heads? I mean, you, you've given a vision for what um, education should be and, may, and hopefully will become as a result of what we're experiencing now. But as we are wrestling with this issue between now and the fall, which is literally right around the corner, what, what, what do, you, do you think the issue is really just focusing on what's safest for people? Um, what do you think it should be the, the, the dominating priority in, in, in a world that has so many competing priorities in, in this crisis. Sure. Yeah, I, I think, first of all, there's no, nothing more precious to any of us than our children, right? I'm, I'm the dad of four children. And so any decision that I would make is always going to be what is the safest thing for them, first of all, right? Like, so if, if they're not safe, nothing else matters. So, and that's, that's an individual choice for every family to make. But, but Whatever your safety quotient is, <laughs> is what you've got to be comfortable with. Um, and so I think thinking about the safety 
of, of your child is the most important thing. And every question that they ask has to be asked through the prism of how safe will they be, right? So I think that that's, that's, that's the most important question for people to ask. Um, and people will answer that in different ways uh, you know, for, for themselves. There, there are some folks who are saying, listen, I'm fine with this blended scheduling that's being proposed where my child will go to school one to two days out of the week. I think that's important. Um, he needs to get out. He's been, she's been in, in the house for four months. She needs to see some of her, her, her peers and her friends. And, uh, and the school is gonna make sure that they're doing the tracing and all the kind of things that they need to do. And if, and if you check all those boxes and you feel safe enough, then that's fine. But I do think that the safety issue is the most important issue that you have to deal with, number one. But once we get beyond that, I think the question really is about challenging how the, the school experience, what do you want that school experience ultimately to be for your child? It's the reason why people make the decisions they make around whether or not they're gonna live in a certain neighborhood, right? Or very often when, you're, when your mom, dad, parent, it's the school always sits at the top of that list because everybody's concerned about what kind of experience I, I, my child will have. And people who have more means maintain even more options in making those decisions. But whoever you are, safety is number one. And then thinking more about what should the educational experience for my, my child be? There are folks who send their children to private independent schools. You know, part of the reason why they do that is because they want them to have a rich educational experience. They want them to be exposed to art and to music. They want them to be exposed to great philosophers and, and, and ch children have an opportunity to sit in a circle or go outside to the park and, 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 ex and explore Plato and, and, and anything else, the great philosophers, like that experience is what everybody should want for their child. Mm -hmm. And I think far too many of us in our educational system in the public schools don't get enough of a rich experience. And I think it's because the use of standardized tests has put us in a place where all we're doing is testing for cognitive skills. But non-cognitive skill development is also critical. And in fact, it's what most Americans want. When most Americans have been polled and they say, what do you want this, what type of students did the school system produce? They want, they want young people who are woke. They want young people who are paying attention, who are engaged civically in the society and who understand what's happening, who understand the issues of the day. That's not what is being produced. And those are the kind of hard questions that we should really be talking about. Students who are paying attention, students who are woke, that's what's happening in, 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 in private schools. I'll give you one final thing before I wrap. Six months ago, you had young people all across the, the country who came out to fight for climate change, to say this, we're the ones that are gonna inherit this world. And the adults have really messed it up. And we got something to say about that. And they hit the streets in, 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 by the millions. And I looked at those, those students all across the country. Very, very few students of color. Why is that? Because white folks understand they're preparing their children to be leaders, yep. to run this world. In the world. And our students are being prepared to be compliant and just go to school. Don't ask any critical questions. Just do your work. And you see, there's a big difference between being educated and just do your work. See, that, that's a, if, you, if you really start to decode that, that means just stay in your place. The, because the powers that be really don't want young people of color to be asking really, criti really critical questions because then that suggests that the positions that a lot of people in power have now folks start to question, well, why is it that you got all of the stuff, right? <laughs> so, man. Right. You, you just set the, the, uh, the su subject matter for your next appearance on Beyond the Hype. But that's a whole <laughs> Listen, David, I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to talk with our audience. Um, definitely going to have you back on the show. You, you raised some major important points beyond, you know, just whether we take our kids back to school or not in the midst of this pandemic. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you, Alfred, anytime. This is Alfred Edmund Jr., SVP, Executive Editor, Large at Black Enterprise, and you've been listening to Beyond the Hype.